Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week, we'll find out what they think about Christopher Luxon and his recent discovery of his backbone. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Miles. Good to have you back. Hello. How are you today, Cam? Fantastic, as usual. I've got a really good one for Excellent. you. Excellent. You can cut loose on this one. So in the last couple of weeks, yeah. in the last couple of weeks, we've seen yeah. Christopher Luxon showing a bit of spine, or if you want to talk in the vernacular, he's found his balls. Uh, he told yeah. he told uh, somebody he told Chloe Swarbrook in Parliament that he believes that Maori ceded sovereignty to gasps of horror from the um, yeah, agitators in Parliament, and then he yeah. then he went to a local body conference and told them there's no more money. You need to cut your cloth and start acting responsibly because the ratepayers are sick of it, which is kind of unheard of. And then on Tuesday, he stood up for Shane Jones in Parliament when Christopher Hitchens decided to question the Prime Minister and saying, you know, Shane Jones has called this uh, judge, uh, Judge Cheryl Gwynn, a communist judge, and uh, and also um, when he was questioned, he said it's a matter of fact and and an adjective. And Luxon came out and said, that Jones was being descriptive, not critical. This is a this this is astonishing. This is like three weeks now of of Christopher Luxon showing a bit of spine. What do you think about that? Well, I'm prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt and say this: that being a politician in Parliament is quite different from anything corporate that uh, Christopher Luxon may well have known before, and perhaps the training wheels have come off. Perhaps Christopher Luxon has discovered what Parliament is actually about. And I'd say one other thing. He's been under some pressure, I would think, whether it be personal pressure or whether it be party pressure, from the poor results that he has been garnering in in the opinion polls. So I'm prepared to look on the bright side and say, well, maybe the training wheels have come off. Maybe he is actually getting to understand what the cut and thrust of politics is all about. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big, everyone knows I'm not a big fan of Christopher Luxon. Uh, I've, I've can always considered him to be a very, very light version of John Key and perhaps not even in the right party. But I'm looking at these three things and, and I'm starting to think maybe I've underestimated this man. Maybe he actually does have a backbone and, and some, you know, decent-sized uh, testicles rather than what it appeared to be a couple of wizened raisins. Uh, you know, it, this is ballsy from him to go up against, you know, the so-called conventional wisdom that sovereignty was never ceded. It's ballsy to say to um, the troffers in local government, no, enough's enough, you're not getting any more money from central government. And it's certainly ballsy to stick up for a minister who thinks a judge is a commie, which he is, by the way, but, you know, that's another matter. Well, hold on a sec. What was so wrong about speaking the truth? Have we got so um, jaded by the Ardernist regime that now speaking the truth is 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 somewhat surprising? I see that Luxon's speaking the truth. Every one of those things is about Luxon speaking the truth. And we want to hear more of it. We want to hear the truth. We don't want to hear some glossy, wokest agenda. We want the councils to be spending their money on the basics. Come on. And the treaty was signed with a whole bunch of disparate tribes. And, you know, 
Of course they ceded sovereignty to the um, British sovereign. Of course they did. There's, there's no question in my mind. And, uh, <laughs> and for Luxon sticking up for Shane Jones, well, that's just another example of someone who's prepared to speak the truth. Shane Jones is. He set the example. Maybe Luxon's training wheels have come off and he's decided that it's not going to hurt him. In fact, it's going to benefit him if he speaks a little bit more of the truth. Oh, yeah. Do you think maybe uh, Luxon's seeing some internal polling that says most people have thought that he's a bit meh? you know, a bit, a bit ordinary and um, would like him to take a stand and he's decided to take that on board and, and start to muscle up? Because that's what it looks like. I think an, that's true. As an insider, you know, that's what I'm reading into this, that he's had some polling that shows that he needs to make a mark. He's seen that Winston and Shane Jones and others aren't, are unafraid of and it's not costing them any support to have a – a wallop at the Wokies, um, you know, or, or bad Maoris or, or whatever that he, he likes to think. And I think he's maybe thinking, you know, he's a pragmatic businessman. He's thinking, well, it works for them. Well, I'll give it a go with me and see how we go. Yep. And just like I said, I think the training wheels have come off. And, you know, politics is quite unlike anything in the corporate world. And, you know, I, as I said, I'm prepared to give the man benefit of a doubt and if he's got a modicum of intellect, which I think he, he probably has, he has probably taken a little bit too long for my personal comfort to work out um, where he should be heading in, in the cut and thrust of politics. But certainly, um, to make some headway, it's not called the cut and thrust of politics for nothing. He has to cut through the the, the, the rubbish, the wokest agendas. He has to speak the truth. And I say, good on him. And I say, may there be much more of this to come. Well, it's, it's certainly, I mean, it's gobsmacking, really. I, I'm, almost, I'm almost, almost lost for words on it. I mean, that's why I decided to get the buddies to talk about it tonight, because I'm just staggered. You know, if only Luxon had shown the side of himself prior to um, to the election, the National might have got over 40% and we'd be have a much stronger government than what we've got now. You know, yes, that, uh, now I think that's true. I think that is true. He, he, he didn't have the formula correct, but to his credit, if this is the direction he has changed to, I believe it's the right one. I believe it's the right one for the supporters that voted him in. And I believe it's the right one for the country. We have to stop this wishy-washy, wokest agenda. We have to stop pandering to half-truths and mistruths. And if Luxon stands up and, and says and speaks the truth, so much the better for, for all of the uh, voters and for the country as a whole. Well, I agree with you, uh, Miles, but um, you know we can have a think about this and maybe we'll revisit it again next week. But it certainly got me thinking that I'm, perhaps I might have misjudged Christopher Luxon. But anyway, well, we'll see what the other buddies have to say about it. Thanks for calling in. All good, Cam. You have a good one. We'll catch you later. Thank you. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. Great to have you back. Great to be back, Cam, and it's a great day. It is a fantastic day, and, and you know, something's happened today that adds to a little list of things that I'm going to run past you, and then I'm going to ask you what you think about Christopher Luxon. So last week, uh, he was sticking it to the local government conference and telling the councils, there's no more money from the central government, get your books in order, uh, listen to the ratepayers, and don't come to us asking for a bailout. And then. In Parliament, he told Chloe Swarbrook that uh, that he believed that Maori ceded sovereignty. You know, to much gnashing and wailing uh, going on from from the, the usual suspects. Uh, and then on Tuesday this week, he's come out and defended Shane Jones for calling a a sitting judge Cheryl Gwynn a communist. Um, now he said that. Uh, Shane Jones was just being descriptive, and, and Shane Jones is right. I mean, she used to be 
a member of the Trotskyist Action um, Group in New Zealand, uh, you know, clear communism. Uh, and I'm sitting, sitting here thinking, I'm kind of gobsmacked. You know, you as you know, I'm not particularly fond of Christopher Luxon. I think he's a bit sort of wet. Um, but I'm starting to see a bit of backbone in him uh, standing up for things. I'm interested to see what you think. Well, starting with the council saying, all well, the council's coming and saying, oh, we want money for this and we want money for that. And so instead of the rate payers of the area paying for it, and the taxpayers pay for it, I'm very concerned that councils have decided to talk in their council meetings about global boiling and all these things that are happening, and so that they want the councils to take away road access and put in um, bicycle access. And, like, you see them spending a lot of time on the Auckland waterfront and you think, well, they're, they're wider, widening the roads, but they're not. They're narrowing the roads and taking away the car parks. And then you've got bicycle accesses there. And then um, I see um, down in Wellington, they wanted some big um, flash arena, which I think they got. And um, But that's sort of a lot of ratepayer money. And so that when the roads have got potholes in them, when the water doesn't work as well as you could, we're running out of water and when we're running out of the basic things that the council needs, but we're doing woke things and um, making sure we've got DEI and all that sort of thing um, going at a maximum rate, I think he's very accurate in saying, don't come to me with a begging bowl, do your basics, and then you'll have enough money. And um, these different councils are going and seeing him saying, we don't want to give our people a rate increase, but we want to do 10 stupid projects as well as the, the three that we're going to do half right instead of doing the, the three things properly and, and ignoring the stupid projects. And then when I see um, that he's calling a judge, and I think uh, Chris Hitchens was going on about how, how dare he say this and how dare he say that. And then um, when... Um, now, Christopher Luxton came back and said he's being descriptive, not insulting. I thought that that was just top shelf. I thought, well, that's a fact, especially if she was, as a youngster, a member of the um, Communist Party or whatever, was, the Trotsky group. Yeah, she, was a, she, was a, she belonged to the Trotskyist Socialist Action League during the 70s and 80s. So this isn't a fleeting thing. This is a couple of decades of being a commie. Well, yeah. You know, I don't know about you, but but I've never met a unionist or a commie that was a commie in the youth that, that kind of changes. They kind of don't. They're, they're indoctrinated into this rubbish ideology that's caused untold misery around the world. And so I, yeah, I think Shane Jones is uh, brave for saying it, but I'm, I'm sitting here gobsmacked that Christopher Luxon didn't use sort of weasel words to try and get around it. He said, no, nah, it's descriptive, not critical. And he's dead right. Yeah. It's a yeah. refreshing change. And I think he's also um, he's saying that the, the, they're making it a bit more difficult for one group of people to get better access to the seabed and foreshore than another. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not unhappy with that either. I think if, if a, a group of uh, citizens in this country have preferential rights over another group of citizens, I think that needs to stop. And if even though he's saying he doesn't want the, um, the treaty rules defined necessarily and that bill might die. He is saying he's making things a little bit more difficult um, because things, well, not difficult, but a bit more accurate of how things should be. And so when I, when I heard that he was um, making it a bit more difficult for people to have um, free-for-all at some of the different um, foreshore and uh, seabed legislation, I'm thinking, well, that can't be all bad. No, okay, it can't be all bad. I'm, I'm actually thinking we're seeing a transition here. I think with with Christopher Luxon from someone who was afraid of his own shadow to someone who's prepared to put a uh, draw a line in the sand or a stake in the ground on particular things. And I think it's refreshing. Um, and as I said, you know, I, I've have not been particularly fond of uh, Christopher Luxon or any of his uh, policies or previous public statements, but I'm starting to like the guy. And it's worrying me a bit. Yeah. 
Well, well, I'm going to give fair due. So if he's doing good things, I think we should encourage. And if he's doing stupid things, I think we should mention. Um, but I also thought he's doing well when he's saying um, we need more supply of energy. So w- I was watching a TV interviewer try to theorise him that the power company is making too much profit. And I'm thinking, but profit's not a bad word. Someone's got to invest in the infrastructure. You can't invest in the infrastructure if you don't make any money. And and then he was saying, well, he's trying to get more energy because if 85% of our energy is renewable and 15% relies on coal and, and gas, and we stop anyone from drilling and mining for coal and gas, um, and then we have to import coal and all the stupid stuff, they wouldn't let him get an get a sentence in on the TV. They kept overshooting him, going back to the profit, 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 like it's a dirty word. Well, without profit, nothing works. So when people make a profit, everything works. And I'm just looking, thinking, and they're saying, oh, they've doubled their profit last week. Well, did they do that in a day? Don't talk stupid. I mean, the reporter was an idiot, in my belief, because the fact that they announced the profit of what they've made on a day doesn't mean they doubled it in a day. I mean, but... They've worked hard at doing things, and they're saying when some people's power bill is up a thousand bucks, well, they probably used quite a few units of power to get up to a thousand bucks. And when the government previously said we can't have any more um, gas exploration, um, so you can import coal because we want to pretend we're green rather than being green. I mean, it's just got such a worse carbon footprint what they've done, and and so by pretending to be green and, and virtue signalling. Um, the energy power price goes up, and it goes up all around the world. All around the world, if you think, oh, gee, we want to have solar and we want to have wind, well, what we also are saying is we want to triple, our, triple and quadruple our power price. So the cheap power is hydro or nuclear hydro and then um, gas and, and coal. All this other stuff is aberrations to look the part but not be the part. Yeah, I mean, I heard some... On a, on, a, on a windless day at night, there isn't a lot of power being generated. <laughs> other than if you had a, um, a, a thermonuclear or if you had um, hydro or if you've got burning coal and gas. And, and it's not it's not as cold during the day when the sun's shining, so the usage happens at night when we're cold and there's no, no sun to drive. And, and when, when the coldest days are the calmest days, when it's a bit blowy, um, you know, it, it's often not as not as cold because they've blown the, um, the clouds away that keep cover and that sort of thing. So anyway, you just look and you think, I'm impressed that Christopher Luxon is starting to take it in small steps, but maybe he's going to be all right. It's early days, and, and we can be hopeful, even though, you know, you know what my thoughts are on hope, um, you know. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, it's not a good thing, but maybe there's some some glimmers of hope here that Christopher Luxon's showing a bit of background and finding out that standing up to these wombles uh, actually is a good thing for his poll numbers. Exactly, and and most people that you talk to are normal; they're not full of this DEI malarkey. Most people don't think that the Harley Davidson ad was a good one, and now that that no one wants to buy a Harley Davidson because some woke CEO. And they're calling for his head because he's not resonating with what the riders of the Harley Davidson motorcycle look like, and it's the same thing. Um, when the when the local um, government council guys go woke, cost their city a fortune, and ask the government to bail them out, and he's saying, "Go, some guys, this is what you want to be doing." Mm. And if he doesn't go woke himself, suddenly New Zealand will be going places. Yeah, well, we can only hope. And uh, we'll have to talk again next week. Thanks for your call, Paul. Okay, thanks. Bye for now. See you. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jack. Hey, Cam. i got a tricky one for you this week. Given your um, your own personal views, I kind of know, but this one's going to be a curveball, so just bear with me. I've just got to run through a couple of scenarios for you, and then I'll ask you a question, and I'll hear your pearls of wisdom. So last week, we saw an amazing sight. We saw Christopher Luxon speaking to the local government um, uh, meeting, you know, the annual meeting that they had in Wellington, and he told them all they needed to cut their cloth, uh, that there was no more money, that they couldn't come to the government to bail them out, and they better sort out uh, 
you know, focusing on things like rubbish and water and, and the things that ratepayers actually want rather than, you know, cycle ways and other woke bullshit. And then he followed that up with um, a bid in Parliament where Chloe Swarbrick uh, from the Greens, the loopy Greens, uh, was asking him if he thought that Maori had ceded sovereignty. And he said, yes, I, I do think that. Uh, you know, I, I would have thought of never of hearing that from his um, coming out of his mouth, but we did. And then Tuesday this week, um, he's come out defending Shane Jones for calling a judge a commie judge or a communist judge, which, of course, is a statement of fact uh, in this case because this judge uh, was a member of the uh, Trotskyist Socialist Action Group um, back in the 70s and 80s. And I'm sitting here wondering, is this the same Christopher Luxon that stood in the election who had all of the spine of a jellyfish and the testicles that look like a couple of, you know, dried out raisins. And I'm wondering, has he found his spine and his balls? What do you think? Well, first of all, I was expecting you to come up with something far more interesting, like Philip Polkinghorn, something oh, like uh, a really yeah. hit the teeth. I'm not interested anyway. in a lurid in a court case of... I'll, I will say one thing about Philip Polkinghorn. Seems he has an eye for the girls, but we'll leave that joke hanging. Jesus. <laughs> well, this is quite prophetic, actually, because um, my dog was taking me for a walk tonight around the block, and a neighbour up the road was being taken by his dog for a walk concurrently on the other side. And mm. we got to talking, of course, as you do. And how are you and all this sort of stuff? Oh, I'm miserable. You know why? And then he got on to politics. Oh, God. Wimpish Prime Minister, if it wasn't for the ACT Party and uh, New Zealand First, he'd be an even bigger wimp. You know, and it got me thinking, and I've said all this before, um, the problem he has is he's a born-again Christian but doesn't have any fun, I believe, and he doesn't want anyone else to have fun. The first thing he did when he got into Air New Zealand was take all of the liquor out of the boardroom. We're not having fun. And I think this is projected. He's, he's... He's a sycophant of, of uh, John Key, who was the biggest wimpish um, pro uh, prime minister we've ever had, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And he's yes, he he's done a few things. They're only words. He's come up, he's come up with a few words to appease people, probably more his um, partners in, in crime, you know, Winston and so forth, and said, you know, come on, you've got to say something here. I think he's been driven by them. Um, no, I don't. I don't think he's grown any balls. I think. Um, I think the strongest uh, drink that he takes is probably milk, and I'm sure he sips, uh, sips, uh, sips a bit of um, estrogen in that when he drinks it. So that's my short answer. <laughs> I knew I could rely on you uh, to say something completely outrageous that all the listeners will write in and give me a absolute shellacking. That how can you have? Yeah, you know, someone like Jack on the show. Well, you know, Jack's a mate, and uh, and all opinions are valid. Um, but you know, I, I kind of was on the same page as you with where Luxon was at. Not, not. I'm not so too. I don't really care that he's a born again Christian. I'm a, I'm a Christian myself, and a few of your mates are Christians as well. But we kind of have fun, though, don't we? We've got to have fun. That's that's the missing component. But I reiterate, if he didn't have um, the Act Party and New Zealand First in there, what sort of a what would he be? Even worse than he is now, and I think, what the hell? Yeah, well, you, know, you you never leave me wondering what you think, Jack, and that's why I love you as a mate. Well, that was actually what my neighbour up the road thought. I was just agreeing. <laughs> yes, I agree. All right, Jack, thanks for your comments there. I so, think our dogs thought the same thing too. <laughs> probably, and then uh, showed the, uh, what they thought on the nearest lamppost. Yes. Yes. Now, my dog's a female, so they don't do that. They sniff the lamppost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, Jack. Thanks All for right. coming in. We'll talk again next week. See you, Cameron. Bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. Good to have you back. Thanks, Cam. Happy Thursday. What have you got for me this week? What I've got for you this week, so look, I've just got to run through a couple of things, and then I'll ask you what you think about these scenarios. Okay. Right, you know, bear with me. Last week, uh, Christopher Luxon went to the local government conference and told them to pull their heads in, start listening to the ratepayers, and there's no more money from central government. That's example one. 
Good. Example two is he stood yeah. up in Parliament and told Chloe Swarbrick that he believed that Maori seed in sovereignty, that Parliament was sovereign, and that's the end of that argument. And then Tuesday this week, he um, sticks up for Shane Jones, who called a judge a communist, and he said, well, it's not insulting, it's actually descriptive. And I'm sitting here thinking, has this man who exhibited all the tendencies of a jellyfish in the election uh, managed to grow a spine and find a set of testicles that are larger than a couple of shriveled raisins? Mate, he finally has grown a spine and is telling it like he should be. Mm. Telling the, telling these woke left commies to go and jump in the lake. Mm. He should, but the problem, he obviously didn't do this for the election because he'd get attacked by our woke media. But he obviously feels safe enough with the polling and the way things are going that he can actually start to act like this. It's fantastic to have the leader that leads, you know. Well, what about Christopher Hipkins? It's, it's amazing. St- stood up in the parliament and and asked Luxon if he if he you know thought this was a good thing for a minister to be saying. You know, I'm sitting there wondering, mate, someone needs to tell you a few things. But now we all know that Hipkins defends commies. Oh, we know that he defended Arden. She's a blatant communist. But also, Hipkins said that Mary didn't cede sovereignty. So who's he saying? Is he saying that the crown isn't sovereign now? which is insane for someone so high in, in the government, yeah. borderline massively problematic. So how would, if Hipkins' theory went ahead, how would our government lock? You know, would we have double government? Where would the tax money go? And who would make their final decisions on things? Imagine the state of the place. Well, but at least... The, 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 the question I'd ask then is if, you know, if Maori didn't cede sovereignty and you believe that, Christopher Hopkins, let's have an election and uh, we'll have New Zealand First Act and National saying, yeah, no, no, they did. And you can campaign on, no, they didn't. And we'll we'll see what the election says. And I suspect that Christopher Hopkins might get shellacked pretty badly. Oh, he would. But it just appears to me that Labour haven't learned anything from the election laws. They're even worse than they were potentially. You'd think they might come back to the centre. No, I don't. Uh, think will. I thought Hitler's would be gone now, but he was buoyed on by the by the poll result that put them on thirty. It saved him. If it was one down, he would have been gone. If it was one on the thirty, he's safe. But I encourage everyone to read Ron Crosby's "The History of the Musket Wars" book. Mm. That will explain a lot about the context around the treaty. It wasn't very. New Zealand was a particularly nice place around. In between 1830 and 1840, especially for Māori, it was a terrible, and the treaty was a way to bring peace. I mean, I, I'm guessing they didn't completely sign over their sovereignty as a direct action, but they needed something to stop the musket wars. And we can't get back in time now. You can't have two governments. It's just The country will cease to function. It's bad for everyone, including Māori. Mm. So these guys need to stop using the treaty for power. It's insane. Mm. It's just, it's going to stuff us. So good on Luxon for standing up for us. He must be doing polling that shows us because he's very poll driven. Do you think his change has come about because the polling was showing that Winston and Shane and, and David Seymour were um, you know, holding their numbers, that they were saying these outrageous things and everybody else in the, in the public was going, yeah, on you, mate. Um, yeah, we agree with you. Um, and he's decided, well, I better have a piece of that because um, National's not going anywhere. There's a sort of stable. Um, you know, perhaps he, he's had an idea that uh, it might be best for him to come out and start putting a stake in the ground. Well, I very much think that's the case. I mean, I, I'm guaranteed they're looking at the polling on this. He, he's just so careful about what he says. But I think National will be fine with its polling numbers as long as the economy comes right. And it's really quite good for New Zealand to have David and Winston that can do the heavy lifting without affecting mm. the soft centre vote, you know? Yeah. Whereas the Greens, Labour is trying to outgreen the Greens. It seems insane. Whereas it, on the right, we've got quite a national, which is real economic focus, and then you've got the fringy stuff with Act and um, Winston Peters. So 
the right's in quite a good position for the next sort of five years, I'd say. Whereas, you know, if Chris Sipman has become Prime Minister, you've got to have the Greens in the Maori Party. Who, who's going to vote for that? Not the soft centre. No. But I, I think that, I think as long as the economy right um, comes good, which it really needs to, we've spoken about that last week or the week before, that, that National will be fine. Um, maybe Luxon can show us who he really is instead of being this woke jellyfish trying to please that really frail soft centre. Yeah, good I mean, on him. I'm so happy with him. Like, oh, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm just thinking, thinking maybe I got this fella wrong, and um, and and maybe we're starting to see the first signs of a, of a backbone growing there, and 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 that this is a pleasing um, development. But but I'm also a little bit reticent to to say, you know, good on you, mate, until he shows a bit more stickability on these things that he doesn't, you know, in the face of relentless left-wing media pressure, start um, yeah, start exactly. debating on his position. Yeah, but he's, to be fair, Kim, he, he took the electorate off Jacinda Ardern, and she had made us just this weak-minded, moddy coral baby nation-state, and he had to gently take us off it and then, you know, move us. He's done a good job. It, it was, it was, New Zealand was in such a terrible state. Everyone forgets how bad it was. And and hopefully by the you know end of this term or the end of the next term we can get back to how we used to be when people actually want to succeed and do well for themselves and don't need to rely on the state. Just the fringes can rely on the state. Anyone else is getting on with it. And and politicians can be more robust because people can handle it. Yeah. You know? Whereas Arda just made us this really weak place. It was terrible. You oh, know, and I think that terribly good on luck and he, he really gent, gently, gently, gently did it, and he's sort of getting stronger as, as the New Zealand sort of slowly recovers from the six years of the communist regime. Totally, you know. And she, 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 she stuffed the place so bad she has to live out of the country. It's not a good, it's not a good thing for Arda. It's not, you know, that's, it doesn't speak well of her that she can't be at home. You know, and when she does, it has to be secret because of the abuse. It just shows how horrendous it was. Well, that's right. She didn't read the room, you know. um, But anyway, that's too bad. That's You make your bed, you've got to lie in it as politicians. And all too often, though, politicians don't suffer any consequences for their poor decision-making or their bad um, choices, uh, you know, when they're in government. And she is suffering consequences, and, and that's as it should be. And um, it's too bad. Absolutely. Hmm. All right, you know, you uh, can't. Jimmy, better, better let you run off to sort out the kids. Okay, thanks, Cam. Uh, See you next week. As always, it's interesting to see what the person on the street thinks. And yet again, today was no different. I wonder if perhaps we should send these chats to Christopher Luxon. Tell us your thoughts on this topic by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you, so connect with us today.